I think it is appropriate to begin this hearing today on the Recovery Act with a reflection on where our nation stood one year ago. Our economy was in a free fall. The Dow was below 6,500, down 54 percent from its high. Less than two months into the Obama administration, unemployment had already hit a 25-year high. People stopped looking at their 401k statements. Spending uh, froze, businesses shuttered, credit disappeared, and everyone wondered when the downward spiral would end. While the nation's collective economic security was disappearing before our eyes, many of the pillars of American strength have been quietly decaying in the shadows for decades. Roads and infrastructure were crumbling. Our schools were sinking deeper into mediocrity. Our middle class was losing ground. At the same time, China, Germany, and other nations were racing past us in the 21st century's greatest growth industry, clean energy. Amidst this storm, Congress passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and it became law on February 17, 2009. As a result, 2 million people have jobs today that otherwise would not. This emergency legislation has not only helped us round the corner on the worst recession in generations, it has become the catalyst for reinvesting in America's future. Nowhere is this reinvestment more apparent than in clean energy where the Recovery Act targeted $90 billion to jumpstart jobs in efficiency, wind, solar, and advanced battery technology, and countless other critical industries. Equally important, these investments are laying the foundation for a new era of innovation and technology development that will provide the next generation of Americans with economic security and job opportunities over the long term. While we still have a long journey ahead of us, I think we need to take stock of how far we have come with the Recovery Act. A decade ago, we had a grand total of 450 megawatts of solar electricity installed in the United States. Flash forward, we installed 480 megawatts of solar in 2009 alone. In 2010, the solar industry is likely to bring online the capacity equivalent of a nuclear power plant. Solar energy programs in the Recovery Act supported more than 10,000 new jobs in 2009, and it is likely to support another 30,000 in 2010. Then there is wind. Four years ago, 25 percent of the components of a wind turbine was made in America. Today, more than 50 percent is made in America. Annual additions of wind power have quadrupled during that time from less than 2,500 megawatts in 2005 to nearly 10,000 new megawatts installed in the United States in 2009. When the wind factories supported by the Recovery Act come online over the next couple of years, the average content is likely to be over 70 percent in these wind facilities. Then we have the advanced batteries that we are going to power the electric vehicles rolling off assembly lines later this year. Asia owns 98 percent of that market today. With Recovery Act investments, U.S. global market share is projected to rise to 20 percent next year and 40 percent by 2015. Imagine the jobs that will be created when we stop seeking when we stop sending $250 billion a year overseas for oil and start sending money to the workers in Michigan and Ohio and build, uh, 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 who are building our electric batteries. Make no mistake, <coughs> clean energy industrialization is happening in America and Recovery Act is playing a major part. Public investment in innovation is a proven all-American pathway to long-term economic security and job creation. The public investment uh, behind Neil Armstrong's one small step uh, spurred giant technological leaps that ensured American economic security for generations. The Recovery Act reoriented America to the future and refocused our efforts on our strengths. Our strength is our ability to innovate. As we move forward into a clean energy future, we will wean ourselves from our greatest weakness, addiction to oil. The Recovery Act laid that foundation. 
A long-term policy like the Waxman-Markey bill, which the House passed last June, will ensure that the thousand flowers of the Recovery Act are likely to fully bloom. That completes the uh, opening statement of the Chair. We now turn and recognize the ranking member of the uh, committee, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you never have to admit you're wrong if you always argue that things could be worse. The unemployment rate is hovering around 10 percent, and the economy has lost 3.3 million jobs since Congress passed the $862 billion stimulus bill. But the majority has still convened today's hearing to celebrate the bill as a success. No matter how sluggish our economy gets, they always can pretend that things are better than they could have been. I am still hopeful that last year's $862 billion stimulus bill will help get people back to work, but this is mostly wishful thinking. Evidence already shows that this massive government program is unlikely to produce any significant growth in the workforce. There are good intentions behind some of these so-called green jobs projects, but we also need accountability. The stimulus program was a failure, and we need an honest accounting as to why. Spending government money can create jobs, but most of these jobs are entirely dependent upon the government subsidies. Take away the subsidy and the job goes too. Based on per unit of energy output, wind and solar energy products receive 50 times more subsidies than coal. <coughs> the subsidies required to create these green jobs result in the loss of economically sustainable jobs in other industries. Experiences abroad have already documented this fact. Spain spent $1.6 billion to subsidize its solar industry. A study from a Spanish university, however, found that for every job this money created, it cost the economy 2.2 jobs in other industries. The same study also found that 9 out of 10 jobs created by the subsidies were temporary in nature. The Obama administration immediately attacked this study, but critics must account for the fact that since implementing the studies, the subsidies, the unemployment rate in Spain has climbed to nearly 20 percent. I know the playbook is to argue that things would have been worse without the subsidies, but when one in five people are unemployed, how much worse can it get? The administration was so frightened by the Spanish statistics that it took the Department of Energy employees described as an unprecedented step of issuing a direct rebuttal. DOE contracted with the National Renewable Energy Lab to produce a response to the Spanish economic study. Documents obtained through a FOIA request by the Competitive Enterprise Institute made it clear that the administration's rebuttal was written in conjunction with wind lobbyists and other advocacy groups. This blatant conflict of interest not only undermines the integrity of NREL's attack, uh, but also exposes the agenda of the report's sponsors. Unfortunately for us, the stimulus bill might actually be of some help to Spain. The investigative reporting workshop, a product of the School of Communication at American University, found that a majority of the pro program's grants went to foreign-owned companies, and that a majority of the turbines purchased with the money were built by foreign manufacturers. The workshop found that, quote, of the $1.05 billion in clean energy grants handed out by the government sub September 1st, 84 percent, a total of $749 million, have gone to foreign wind companies. The Spanish utility company Iberdrola SA alone has collected $545 million through its American subsidiary. In response to a letter from Democratic senators criticizing the stimulus program, Secretary Chu wrote that, quote, all the wind turbine installation jobs are created here in America, unquote. So we're spending U.S. taxpayer money to create long-term manufacturing jobs abroad and consoling ourselves because we're also creating a few short-term construction jobs here at home. The job creation benefits of the stimulus package were further undermined by the Democrats' political alliance with unions. The Government Accounting Office recently found that the pro-union Davis-Bacon language in the stimulus bill meant Energy Department officials have to spend valuable time determining the prevailing wages for these so-called green jobs. This bureaucratic exercise cost valuable time during a period where many Americans needed the work. In the case of weatherization, 
the Energy Department spent only 8 percent of the nearly $5 billion budgeted to improve energy efficiency in homes across the country. Indeed, a study by the Heritage Foundation shows that David Bacon rules require government contractors to pay wages that average 22 percent above the market rate, and suspending Davis Bacon rules would let the government hire 160,000 additional workers. I'm glad that Brian Johnson of Americans for Tax Reform is here to tell us more. He'll testify that Davis Bacon rules reduced the job creating benefits that the stimulus bill sought to create. The question is, what are the priorities of the authors of the stimulus bill? I also want to welcome Mary Ann Wright of Johnson Controls, who are based in my district, and thank her and her company for their work in cutting edge battery power. I believe the only way we can confront climate changes through technological breakthroughs, then I am in fact the lead author and original sponsor of the Hybrid Truck Act, which is twice past the House. I hope this hearing proves to be the beginning of legitimate oversight rather than an attempt to spin ineffective policies and yield back the balance of my time. Great. Gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentlelady from South Dakota, Ms. Herseth Her Sandlin. I thank the Chairman uh, for holding this hearing, giving us the opportunity. to examine how the Recovery Act has played a key role in maintaining and fostering the new energy economy. Uh, I supported the Recovery and Reinvestment Act in order to prevent the worst recession since World War II from lasting longer and going deeper, uh, and to build infrastructure and invest in other ways in the future of South Dakota and the country. Uh, as an example, South Dakota has already been allocated $9.6 million in Recovery Act smart grid funding. Black Hills Power in the western part of the state is slated to receive $5.6 million in Recovery Act funds with a 50 percent cost share to install smart metering technology, and Sioux Valley Energy Electric Cooperative was awarded $4 million to install smart meters. As virtually every economist agrees, we needed an aggressive economic recovery package to uh, stem the loss of jobs, to save jobs, to create jobs, and reinvigorate demand for goods and services that had evaporated in the economic collapse triggered by a financial meltdown originating from risky and unconscionable actions on Wall Street. Our nation was in a free fall, losing hundreds of thousands of jobs a month, and we needed to act. As South Dakota's Republican governor has said, the Recovery Act played a key role in balancing South Dakota's budget in multiple years while reducing cuts to critical programs as our state suffered from the downturn. Moreover, one of the key components of the Recovery Act, conveniently overlooked by its critics, is that over a third of it is tax cuts for families and, sp and businesses, including a long-term extension of the production tax credit for wind through 2012, a tax credit of up to $800 per family for 2009 and 2010, tax relief for small businesses, and a cut in the capital gains tax for those who invest in small businesses. In addition, I have met with homegrown wind developers and other domestically headquartered wind blade manufacturers who have brought hundreds of jobs to South Dakota, who have praised the Recovery Act's extension of the production tax credit and the new Treasury grant in lieu of the investment tax credit included in the Recovery Act. I have heard firsthand how these measures are allowing the survival of domestic wind development in the United States, creating jobs, and fostering economic development in rural communities. So I thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing and look forward to the testimony of our witnesses today. We thank the gentlelady. The uh, gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think it is important for us to um, take a look at uh, the impact of the uh, era legislation. Mr. Chairman, I was in the room as a member of the Financial Services Committee. I was sitting there when President Bush's Secretary of the Treasury, Hank Paulson, along with Ben Bernanke, along with Mr. Cox, our former, uh, our, um, former colleague, uh, and Sheila Baer, sat in a table not dramatically unlike the table before us today, and from their lips fell the most bone-chilling testimony I have ever heard uh, since uh, being in government. They explained to us that if the Fed did not act quickly, that the U.S. economy would fall from the precipice, taking with it 
the economy of the planet. President Bush pushed hard to take action, and I don't disagree, and we took action. We then, after electing President Obama, began to address this problem that was deepening I, even after trying to uh, put a tourniquet on the uh, Wall Street entities that uh, could have also taken down uh, other uh, financial institutions around the country. President Obama put forth a uh, stimulus package. Some, like Paul Krugman, the uh, economist, uh, journalist, uh, believed that it was too small, that you can't have a 15 or $17 trillion economy and try to completely turn things around with uh, less than a trillion dollar uh, stimulus. Nonetheless, uh, we approved it and I supported it and supported it uh, strongly. If you look at the job losses in the United States over the last decade, you would be alarmed because many of those jobs, even after this recession ends, will not return. And I fear that the 3.5 unemployment, uh, full employment uh, number is going to have to be adjusted, that no longer can we expect full employment to be when 3.5% of the American public is unemployed. That's going to, going to probably go up after this recession is over. So the only thing remaining for us to do is create new jobs. And ERA gave us the opportunity to create new jobs. In Kansas City, Missouri, one of the cities I represent in Missouri, we used the money to create a, what's called the Green Impact Zone, 150 blocks of the most decrepit uh, piece of geography in urban uh, America. One census tract shows unemployment at 70 percent. The Kansas City Star did a story on this tract and called it the murder factory. We've been able since ERA to get a matching grant from the Department of Energy to match a $24 million grant from our power and light company to begin the construction of a smart grid. Uh, men and women are hired today, this day, who live in the green impact zone, who will be a part of the construction team for the smart grid. And we are weatherizing 3,000 homes. And the men and women doing the weatherization are men and women who were unemployed. And yes, some of them were union uh, 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 members. But the point is, uh, and I close, Mr. Chairman, that this is working and working well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The gentlelady from California, Ms. Spear. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm glad that we're here today to discuss clean energy, energy jobs, which are crucial not only for our economic recovery, but for our long-term economic growth. On Monday of this week, I organized a bus tour to inspect the progress of uh, recovery projects in my district. From 300 construction jobs at the San Francisco airport, uh, job training for transportation workers, new buses fueled by uh, biofuel, aid to services for the unemployed, and a collaborative partnership to secure $2 million in grants to rehouse the homeless, I can see the impact of timely and targeted recovery funding working uh, in my district. What was uh, very interesting during the tour was that I visited <coughs> a company that builds super efficient surge protectors for our electric grid to shield consumers from blackouts. The company received $8.5 million era grant dollars to fund an installation in Southern California and has already expanded its headquarters um, to a larger facility. One thing they pointed out to me, though, was that uh, there's no testing facility in the United States. So they have to actually transport, transport this, this huge piece of equipment uh, to Vancouver uh, to test it. 
uh, another opportunity for us to start growing some of these opportunities at home. Another company based in South San Francisco received $21 million in recovery funding to build an advanced biofuels refinery in Pennsylvania, which will create jobs in both locations and will help them scale up production of a cutting edge renewable biofuel to help break our addiction to oil. Finally, my district is home to the nation's leading solar power provider from honor, for homeowners on up to federal uh, government. And thanks to the Recovery Act policies for renewable energy providers, it has ended its hiring freeze and plans to add 16 new solar installation crews in the coming months. Um, I know we have um, much to hear from our witnesses, and um, I yield back. The general lady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington State, Mr. Inslee. Yeah, I, I want to make a point about Aura. Maybe someone's already said it. Um, I just met a woman named Elena Myers, who uh, was our gold medal winner in the bobsled competition in Vancouver. And it's the first time I ever got to hold a gold medal. And they're, they're pretty heavy. It was pretty cool. Uh, but it made me think about another competition we're in, which is who's going to get the gold medal in the clean energy economy. And if it wasn't for Aura, uh, we would be giving a huge jump start, a head start to China. And um, Aura allowed us to get out of the chute, at least to begin getting into this competition with the rest of the world to see who's going to be preeminent in clean energy. And I just want to make two points about why Aura was successful in getting us into the race. Um, two companies I'll mention, I, mentioned, I met a fellow from Johnson Controls the other day who said they're going to start building a lithium ion battery uh, manufacturing plant in Michigan, hopefully construction this fall, which would not have happened but for Aura. And we would not have any meaningful manufacturing plant in the United States but for Aura in this regard. And in the R&D provision, we have a company called Energy2. It's in Seattle, got a 20 million plus grant to find a way to use nanotechnology to make ultracapacitors potentially 15 times more uh, efficient, more dense. So Aura has got us into the race. We're a long ways from the finish line, but we're in the race, and we wouldn't have been for it, and I'm glad we're in the race. Great. And um, gentlemen's time has expired. And uh, maybe what we could do is begin by hearing from Johnson Control. The gentleman from uh, Washington State has uh, you know, given her, given the Johnson Control a little bit of a plug here. And so uh, while the gentleman's here, and we apologize to the other uh, witnesses who have been told what the order will be, um, uh, I thought maybe we could start with you, uh, Mary Ann Wright, uh, Vice President of Johnson Controls and Managing Director of the company's Business Accelerator Project for Advanced Energy Storage uh, uh, Solutions. Uh, perhaps you could expand upon what Mr. Inslee was just uh, referring to. Can you move it in? Yep, yep move it in a little go. bit. Move it How's in closer. That? Good. So uh, thanks for changing up the order. Now I can sit back in a minute. Um, first of all, Chairman Markey, um, Congressman Sensenbrenner, and the rest of the members, thank you very much for inviting us here to tell you what we're doing with our recovery matching grant. Um, and I also appreciate that you did it today because I have to head back to Milwaukee and uh, greet all of my new employees in Milwaukee uh, that we're hiring as a result of the, the work we're doing in the United States. I have three things that I want to talk about. One is the state of the industry in general. Number two is what we are doing with our stimulus grant. And then number three, the challenges that we face. Um, I think you have a packet of some pictures. It's also in your written testimony. And I'd just like to kind of talk you through this, because if you look at this, um, what should pop out at you is it's a pretty scary picture. Um, if you take a look over on the right, uh, a cell, which is this, and there's about 100 to 200 of them in these electric vehicles, 50 to 75% of the value is in the cell. All of these materials come from the, virtually the Pacific Rim, who has a stranglehold on the supply base. Over on the, the left-hand side is the system, and that's the, where we put the cells and integrate it and put it into the vehicle. And if you, if you think about this for a minute, if we don't change this, we will change our oil cartel, our OPEC oil cartel, for an Asian battery cartel. And to scare you a little bit more, our Pacific Rim friends aren't standing still. They continue to invest in manufacturing capability, technology, and capacity. 
in uh, 2008, uh, Johnson Controls opened up the world's first lithium ion manufacturing facility for automobiles in Nersac, France. Um, out of that facility, we supply on a mass production scale uh, Daimler and BMW. For pre production, we support our customers Ford, Azure Dynamics, Jaguar, Land Rover, and Volkswagen. In 2009, we were the recipient of a stimulus uh, grant. And the key thing that I would like you to uh, take away, and uh, Congressman Inslee, you stole my thunder, and the fact is, um, in absence of this grant, we would not have expanded our manufacturing in the United States. We were looking in Europe and in Asia. But because of this action, we are going to build our first manufacturing facility in Holland, Michigan. As a matter of fact, it's up. We're retrofitting it, and we will begin production later this year for one of our customers and begin full-scale cell production next year. We're moving fast. We're moving decisively. And um, we're very encouraged by the actions that the legislator has taken. Um, I think also, and it's, it's maybe something uh, Congressman Inslee doesn't know, is that by 2012, we will move and transition all of our European production into this U.S. facility. And I think that's a, that's a real um, feather in our cap versus what typically is happening in our economy. Um, when we were awarded our grant, our commitment wasn't just to put up a plant, but that we would help stand up an industry. And um, that involves everything from our raw material suppliers all the way to our end-of-life uh, recycling infrastructure. Johnson Controls presently is the largest uh, provider of your starter batteries and the largest recycler of these batteries as well. So we're going to build on those capabilities of a, of a long-standing mature company and industry to be able to transition that into lithium-ion. But if you think about the materials for a moment, uh, as I said, most of those come from the Pacific Rim. One of our, our commitments is to develop a domestic supply base. I'm very happy to let you know that we've recruited two Asian suppliers to the United States who will be setting up business in Michigan and supplying the U.S. market. We, we need to continue to, however, develop a domestic supply base as well. We have great partners in Ford Motor Company, Azure, Daimler, BMW. We have terrific long-standing partnerships with Argonne National Lab and Oak Ridge to continue to work on our technology. Um, in Milwaukee, which is our headquarters for this business, we've stand, stood up uh, a team called the Accelerator Team, which I lead, and our job is to accelerate the demand creation and the technology and innovation so that we can have a sustainable business that does not rely on subsidies and incentives that can be profitable. So while we have customers, this is terrific. We have some great partners. We have, we have an issue. And one of the graphs that I gave you was the, um, the demand. And if you take a look out uh, in the 2015 time frame, we believe there will be about 4 million units of global capacity versus 2 million units of demand. In North America alone, there will be about 2 million units of capacity and 800,000 units of demand. We have got to find a way to fill that, that gap. Transition of government fleets is going to be an important piece of that because, one, it allows us to drive scale, which is a key part of our business equation. And number two, we have over a million units in these fleets through the GSA and the Postal Service that are perfectly suited. In, because I'm running out of time and in respect, I want to leave you with a, one um, key piece, however, is that we need to make sure we leverage these recovery investments as we transition these fleets and as we build our industry. Shouldn't we give preference to vehicles that are built with batteries and electric drive components that come from investments that we made here in the United States so that we don't allow these vehicles and this industry to transition from a Middle Eastern OPEC to an Asian battery cartel? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Wright, uh, very much. And uh, thank you for telling us something Jay Inslee doesn't know. Okay, that's also that's a first in this committee. So we thank you for that as well. Um, now, our next witness is Paul Gaynor, who is the CEO of First Wind, an independent uh, company focused on the development, ownership, and operation of wind farms. Uh, Mr. Gaynor has over 20 years of experience in the energy industry and has been involved in the financing of these projects around the world. We welcome you, sir. Thank you, Chairman Markey, uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Paul Gaynor. I'm the CEO of First Wind, a U.S.-owned independent wind energy company based in Massachusetts. We are focused on the development, financing, construction, ownership, and operation of utility-scale wind farms in the United States. 
We have been in business since 2002, and today we operate about 500 megawatts of clean, renewable wind power through six operating projects in Maine, New York, Utah, and Hawaii. Currently, we are wrapping up construction on our seventh project, the Stetson II expansion in Maine. All in all, these facilities represent an investment of approximately $1.2 billion. First Wind currently employs over 200 professionals in nine states in this new industry. In the communities that we work, we also rely heavily on people uh, in these communities with local knowledge in order to properly site, build, and operate wind farms. Our projects generate significant amounts of employment and economic activity, which I will cover in more detail shortly. I have been asked to address the impact of the clean energy provisions of the Recovery Act on our company. And the answer is, in short, the Recovery Act has been profoundly, profoundly important to our ability to continue to grow and make investments in renewable energy facilities. This has also resulted in approximately 1,000 jobs in 2009, and we expect a similar number in 2010. The Convertible Investment Tax Credit, or ITC, has, has had the most impact. With the collapse of the credit markets in 2008, sources of capital practically dried up overnight. As a relevant example, we lost a $140 million firm commitment from Lehman Brothers for a project that was under construction in New York. Uh, then Lehman filed for bankruptcy and the commitment was lost. At that point, all sources of capital were frozen and an analysis by the American Wind Energy Association shows that in 2009, wind power development might drop by as much as 50% from the 08 levels. Fortunately, Congress and the Obama administration recognized the threat to, to, that this extraordinary economic turmoil presented to our industry and responded with urgency and effectiveness. Thanks in large part to the clean energy provisions of the Recovery Act, the U.S. wind industry broke all previous records by installing nearly 10,000 megawatts during 2009, as the chairman noted in his opening comments. The Recovery Act provided the help we needed when we needed it. During 2009, First Wind completed construction of wind facilities in Maine, New York, and Utah, and began construction on another project in Maine. In partnership with our general contractors, RMT of Wisconsin, Morton Construction of Minnesota, and Reed and Reed of Maine, we created over 1,000 jobs during the construction of the, these facilities. And without the convertible tax credit program, the, the construction, job creation, and, and long-lasting economic impacts would, would not have happened. Using the Stetson project and the ongoing expansion as an example, the combined facility represents a $220 million investment with over 130 local main businesses providing goods and services during the development and construction phases, about 550 construction jobs on both phases. For another example, I draw your attention to the pamphlet that I've handed out, uh, which outlines the economic benefits of our 200 megawatt Milford Wind project in Utah. In this project, over 60 local businesses participated, creating 250 jobs on site and supporting an additional 200 jobs in the region. Additionally, because of the Recovery Act, we've been aggressive in forging ahead with our business plans in 2010 and beyond. We plan to construct a second phase in Utah, plus additional projects in Maine, Vermont, New York, and Hawaii, representing an, an additional 300 megawatts of power capacity and an, an, an incremental $650 million of new investment in this sector. The success of the 1603 program, importantly, has sent a strong signal to the capital markets and mobilized significant incremental capital. In our case, the Recovery Act funding has spurred an additional $695 million of our own equity and loans from banks. We expect a similar impact on our 2010 plans. Wind power is a capital-intensive business, and thus the opportunity to use Recovery Act funding to leverage significant private investment has been extraordinarily effective and important. Additionally, I want to let you know that last week, Secretary Chu announced that one of our projects has received a conditional commitment from the DOE under the Innovative Loan Guarantee Program. The Kahuku Project in Hawaii uses an innovative battery storage system to address some of the wind integration issues facing the local utility. We encourage Congress to follow the leadership of Chairman Markey and others on this committee who are trying to foster a more stable and predictable investment and regulatory climate for renewable energy. In particular, we hope Congress will make it a priority to extend the convertible tax credits this year. Access to capital has improved, but it remains far short of pre-financial collapse conditions. Thank you for the opportunity to take part in this hearing. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, sir, very much.
Our next witness is uh, Lisa Pat McDaniel. Uh, she is the director of the Ohio Department of Development, and she leads efforts to accelerate Ohio's economic growth through development of high growth industries. Uh, she oversees Ohio's Recovery Act efficiency programs, including weatherization. Welcome. Thank you, Chairman Markey and Ranking Member Sessenbrenner, members of the committee. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today on behalf of Governor Strickland and myself. The Ohio Department of Development is responsible for distributing over 522 or 512, I'm sorry, million dollars in stimulus funding through a variety of programs ranging from homeless assistance to renewable energy deployment. Ohio's nationally recognized Home Weatherization Assistance Program is administered by our department's Community Development Division and specifically our Office of Community Services. We're providing assistance for citizens whose annual household income is at or below 200 percent of the federal poverty guidelines. The state's weatherization budget from the federal stimulus is more than $266 million. More than 32,000 housing units will be weatherized during the three-year grant period, and more families will get the help they sorely need, and local businesses will see an increase in sales of materials, supplies, and trucks to carry out the larger program. Ohio's process for utilizing weatherization resources effectively and expeditiously is one of the reasons I have the honor of speaking to you today. Ohio was recently recognized by the USDOE as leading the nation in spending Recovery Act dollars to weatherize homes, with Ohio completing more than one in five of the projects reported nationally last year. Since July 2009, our state has weatherized over 8,100 homes. Dwellings weatherized to date represent 103 percent of our planned production so far meaning that we've weatherized an additional 240, 204 additional units than originally planned. And importantly, the additional support for our weatherization program has required the creation of another 1,000 jobs and retained 1,500 jobs as of December of 2009. We believe there are several reasons why our state was able to ramp up and respond to the needs of our citizens so quickly. And just to highlight, we have an excellent weatherization network we have um, a large list of eligible households that we had before the Recovery Act was passed. We have an excellent Ohio Weatherization Training Center. It's run by our Corporation for Ohio Appalachian Development, and we established three training hubs so we can train people to work in these jobs quickly. And importantly, we instructed our providers to go ahead and start weatherizing homes with these funds as of July 1st knowing that we would have to uh, make up our staff salaries and retroactively adjust them once the prevailing wage rates were uh, issued by the U.S. Department of Energy. By reducing household energy expenditures, increasing energy efficiency, and improving the safety of homes owned or occupied by low-income Ohioans, we have a foundation to make our state a cleaner, more efficient place to live. There are several important programs that complement our efforts to create jobs and promote energy efficiency, and these are through the State Energy Program, which received $96 million of recovery assistance. We designed programs through that set of money to stimulate the economy through the retention and creation of jobs, saving energy, increasing generation from renewable energy projects, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I'm going to briefly touch on the programs that we designed with that $96 million. But the programs were meant to support our aggressive renewable energy portfolio. It's the, most aggressive, the third most aggressive portfolio in the nation. And we wanted to make sure that the jobs, um, that we created jobs with the focus of this expenditure of these programs. We set up a Deploying Renewable Energy in Ohio initiative, which is investing more than $42 million of those funds through renewable deployment projects, focusing on strengthening Ohio's manufacturing industry, transforming waste to value by capitalizing on what would other be considered waste byproducts from Ohio's agricultural and food production industries, and turning it into a source of renewable energy. We took $8 million and al allocated it to making efficiency work through grants to help fund greater energy efficiency projects. Our targeting industry efficiency program provides for $15 million in grants to manufacturing companies seeking to improve the sustainability of Ohio's industry. 
the banking on new energy and financing, which we also call the Ohio Energy Gateway Fund, is a public-private partnership that will expand access to capital to grow and sustain the fuel cell, solar, wind, and energy storage industries in Ohio. And finally, setting the stage for Ohio's Carbon Management Strategy Initiative, which is allocating $500,000 to organize an integrated collaborative planning process to address energy policy. The announcement of the targeted industry eff efficiency portion of the state energy program will create an estimated 217 jobs across the state. If you could wrap up, please. Yes. In conclusion, I'd just like to say that we're building on the foundation with the Recovery Act funds, and they've been very important to us in promoting Ohio's economy. And I thank the chairman and the ranking member and the committee members for having me speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next uh, witness is uh, Brian Ashley. He is the chief marketing officer of the solar company Suniva and has most recently led Suniva's emergence into the Indian and European solar photovoltaic markets. Uh, we look forward to hearing from you, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, ranking member Sensenbrenner. I'm very proud and honored to be here before the committee today. Suniva is a great American jobs and export success story. We manufacture some of the world's most efficient and highest power of silicon solar cells and modules, and we use low-cost manufacturing techniques to do so. Therefore, we can beat the Chinese at their own game. In fact, this is what we make in Norcross, Georgia. It's about 4.3 watts when the sun shines on it. And Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to give this to you. You can tape it on the uh, module that you have in your office and modernize it a little bit. Uh, we're a little more efficient than we used to be. Uh, Suniva was spun out of the Department of Energy funded University Center of Excellence in Photovoltaics at Georgia Tech University with a deep patent portfolio of American patents and technology and access to one of the best solar labs in the world for our research and development. It's a great example of governmental funded research helping create U.S. industry leadership and 150 new jobs since 2007 when we were founded. Very good, well paying jobs, I might add. We currently have 100 megawatts of capacity in our plant near Atlanta, and we do produce the highest efficiency at low-cost solar cells in the world. We produce 18 percent efficiency cells today. Most of our competitors are at about 16.8 percent. Uh, and that, that efficiency, of course, represents the amount of sunlight actually converted to electricity. Uh, we expanded in 2009. We added 80 new direct jobs, provided over 200 indirect jobs, and spent $19 million on new equipment for our lines. Uh, we received 48 C credits of $5.7 million uh, for that investment, and we thank you very much. This was very important to the expansion and being able to add these jobs sooner than we would have been able to. Domestic demand has also been stimulated for solar thanks to the Treasury 1603 provisions, which gave us the additional confidence to move up the expansion dates earlier than planned, as well as for our plant two, which I'll mention in a minute. And the demand there is turning into real business here in the United States. Uh, we currently employ many former auto workers and managers from shuttered GM and Ford plants in the Atlanta metro area, and 24 percent of our workforce, I'm proud to say, are veterans, mostly from the Iraq War. Uh, we exported 90 percent of our 2009 production. We're beating the Chinese. Uh, I, ex I exported to India, China, South Africa, even a little to Taiwan. The first grid-connected solar farm in India in West Bengal is powered by Suniva cells manufactured by workers in Norcross, Georgia, instead of Shanghai. Currently, the uh, second largest solar farm in India, in Karnataka State, which Prime Minister Singh will inaugurate this month himself, is also powered by American technology made in Norcross, Georgia. The roof of the new sports stadium in New Delhi that will uh, be home to the Commonwealth Games, has 1.1 megawatts of Suniva cells. We have power fields in Germany, Italy, and France powered by Suniva, and the list is growing. Uh, we plan to export at least 85 percent of our production this year, which is greatly expanded from last year, if we can expand quick enough. Our problem is we're sold out. We've had to turn away new export customers since last December, unfortunately, including another Chinese company that wants to buy my products. We've had to impose limits on the allocations to our current customers. I was in India three weeks ago on a U.S. Commerce Department trade mission and had to turn business away. I'm sad to say that Chinese and Taiwanese workers will benefit from that and get that business rather than more U.S. workers. The Chinese and Taiwanese are very, very serious about owning the solar PV value chain, which we in this country have neglected far too long. 
uh, and they will own it like they own many other manufacturing industries if we don't continue to do what you've started to do in the last year to help support us. Uh, there are many high, very large, well-funded Asian businesses who are trying very hard to do what we do. Right now, we're the only ones that do what we do in the world with our technology. But they'll catch up with us. They'll figure it out, and we've got to stay ahead of them. And we've got to spend a lot of money on that research and development to stay ahead of them. But we've also got to spend money on expanding and creating new jobs to meet that customer demand. It's a big trade-off. And right now, it's hard to borrow money still. It's damn hard to borrow money still, I'm sorry to say. We're currently building out a 30,000 square foot physical extension to our facility in Atlanta right now, adding another new 70 megawatt line. That's 50 new direct jobs we're hiring right now and 200 indirect jobs in construction. An extension or extra funding of 48C like the President has uh, asked for will help us a lot, especially if it's refundable quickly so we can turn it into cash. We would immediately apply if that were to happen. Reasonable financing is very hard to get. We're planning our second plant a 400 megawatt initial capacity plant in Saginaw, Michigan. 500 direct jobs, 2,100 indirect jobs according to Michigan Economic Development. This plant will grow to a gigawatt eventually. We're waiting word right now from the DOE on a loan guarantee so we can break ground and start this. Again, at 48C, we're expanded and refundable. Like 1603, we put in an application ASAP for, for that equipment. Other areas where you can help create more clean tech jobs are an RES or an RPS and certainly a national feed and tariff would be extremely helpful. Uh, we're competing against the Chinese. We need U.S.-based solar industry as a matter of national security, I believe. I invite all of you to come to Atlanta, see our facility, and see the jobs, see the former auto workers and the veterans working there. It's real. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ash, very much. And our final witness today is Brian Johnson. He is the Federal Affairs Manager for Americans for Tax Reform and is the Executive Director of the Alliance for Worker Freedom. Welcome, you, welcome, sir. Whenever you're ready, please begin. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, and members of the Select Committee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the effects of the Recovery Act on our economy with respect to green job creation. Government spending of this magnitude cannot stimulate our economy. Every dollar spent attempting to force the market toward a specific sector is subject to taxation and must be first borrowed out of our economy. The result is a redistribution of existing purchasing power rather than the creation of new purchasing power. This spending creates less economic activity than if the money had been left with private sector investors. The goal was to create 3.6 million jobs according to the administration's own estimates. Since signed into law, we have lost 3.3 million jobs. According to recovery.gov, there were 440 non-existing congressional districts that saved or created false jobs to the tune of $225,000 per job. Any potential impact the recovery package brought to the economy was virtually negated by the application of a 1931 market distorting wage law known as the Davis-Bacon Act. Investigators from the Office of Inspector General found that, quote, one or more errors existed in 100 percent of the wage reports they reviewed. The Davis-Bacon Act artificially inflates wages on average by 22 percent nationwide and construction costs by almost 10 percent. Application of this wage law added $17 billion to the Recovery Act and is impeding efficient implementation of the weatherization program nationwide. Mismanagement of the Recovery Act not only encompasses wasted money in the United States, but much of the money spent actually creates jobs overseas. Eighty percent of the first $1 billion spent on grants to wind energy companies went to foreign firms. In the second round of government grants, 79 percent of the $2.1 billion went to wind companies based overseas. The Renewable Energy Policy Project estimates that for one megawatt of wind energy that's developed, 4.3 jobs are created. The 1,219 turbines built by foreign-owned manufacturers have a potential capacity of 2,280 megawatts. Using their estimate, the installation of these turbines may have created as many as 6,838 manufacturing jobs overseas. Domestically, the market-altering subsidization has the same negative economic effects. The Mojave Desert Solar Power Project received $1.4 billion from the Recovery Act. Construction of that facility required 1,000 workers, but only 86 permanent employees to run the plant. That's $16 million in taxpayer subsidies per permanent job. In Florida, the DeSoto Solar Center was supposed to be the, quote, largest solar power plant in the U.S., according to President Obama. The center received $150 million from the Recovery Act. After using 400 construction workers to build the site, the solar center now employs only two people. The single largest wind grant under the program reported by the Department of Energy on December 29th was $178 million for the Texas Gulf Wind Farm in Sarita, Texas. 
All 118 turbines erected on the farm were built by Mitsubishi, a Japanese firm that does not build wind components in the United States. Perhaps the most evident use of mismanagement and inherent inefficiencies lie in the failed weatherization program. While some states have experienced success, national results have been dismal. The Recovery Act provided $5 billion to weatherize 593,000 homes. ABC News reports that less than 10,000 homes have been weatherized nationwide, while the Department of Energy claims 22,000 homes have been impacted, which is still less than 4 percent of the targeted goal. So far, the Inspector General, General found the jobs impact, quote, has not materialized, and the application of costly Davis-Bacon requirements calls $57,000 per home weatherized nationwide on a national average. A state-by-state -state look exposes the localized impact of this flawed national program. New York has $394 million available and planned to weatherize 45,400 units, but only did 280. Alaska, Rhode Island, Wyoming, and Washington, D.C. were given over $50 million combined to weatherize homes. To date, zero homes have been impacted. The biggest expenditure in the stimulus weatherization program is $270 million. Not one penny of that went to actual home weatherization, but was given to the Department of Energy to administer grants. The Recovery Act was supposed to be timely, effective, and show immediate results. The realization is using the invisible hand of the government to artificially tilt the economy will never be sustainable. Responsible solutions should remove barriers to private investment and should incorporate an all-of-the-above energy approach using a diverse blend of sources without raising taxes or increasing the regulatory burden. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, sir. Um, you spoke so fast you left yourself 30 seconds over. Uh, <laughs> the chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank all of you uh, for your, your testimony. Uh, I, I, I'm a little concerned. Um, we, we just had uh, economic output rise at the slowest level this past decade, since any decade since, the since 1930. Uh, which means we, we have uh, a serious challenge. And I'm curious, Mr. Johnson, um, if, if you are criticizing government subsidies in the development of energy technology, uh, let me make sure that, that, you, that, that you are. Is that correct? Uh, yes. OK. Um, are you? Or do you ever find it necessary to criticize government subsidy of the oil industry? Uh, much of the term, the term subsidy has been thrown around a lot. Uh, one of the things that a lot of industries benefit are tax cuts. Uh, for example, Section 199 is a domestic manufacturer's tax deduction that all companies who manufacture domestically in the United States get. Okay. I don't have a lot of, a lot of, we only have five minutes, so do you, do you, are you equally upset that uh, we have subsidized the oil industry approximately $150 billion uh, from, uh, at least from, from 1968 to, to the year 2000, $150 billion. We don't have the, the, this decade's uh, subsidization, so, I mean, I'm sure, does that, bother you? Yes, I think targeted spending towards any industry uh, is flawed. So let me suggest what should we do when we have, when we have an economic downturn, uh, should we uh, say, you know, we're not helping create any new jobs, uh, we're going to uh, sit around and remain happy and allow the rest of the world to overtake us? I mean, wh what would you have done had you been sitting in the room uh, with uh, the people I named earlier? Sure. Um, you can create jobs without targeted spending. One of those ways, like I mentioned, is tax cuts. You can freeze spending and, restrate uns and rescind unspent stimulus funds. You can reform regulations to reduce unnecessary business costs. And if you are intent on spending, you can make sure it's done efficiently and effectively by suspending all Davis-Bacon Act requirements. Okay. Are you aware that 30 percent of, of error were tax cuts? 30 percent, yeah. You yeah. were aware of that? Yes. So you don't support that? I support the tax cut component. So, the majority so, of the plan was spending. So. 836 billion. So, so you, we should have done a stimulus package that, were, that was in, in, in fact 
a tax cut package? I think we should have done the tax cuts without the targeted spending. So we should have had a stimulus package without a tax cut? I'm not I mean, supportive of a stimulus package at all. Including the tax cuts? The tax cuts as part of the package, the tax cuts were support, I support. Tax you said you didn't general, support any of this, but you the said stimulus you in terms of targeted massive government spending programs. But the tax cut was supposed to stimulate the economy. The tax cuts are not spending. The the, the part of this most of the stimulus package was direct spending. Which so you don't is support tax in cuts in favor of targeted certain industries. So you don't support tax cuts. I support tax cuts. I oppose targeted spending. They're they're they're, they're two separate components. Well, I, I understand clearly what they are, but I'm 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 saying. Uh, you said uh, you support tax cuts, but you don't support any stimulus. I'm telling you the tax cuts were, were part of the stimulus. And you're saying, so I just want to know what you support. I support tax cuts and so you would have, it, government spending. Okay, so after we put the tax cuts in, that should have been the, the, the bill we approved. The bill should have been a broad-based massive tax cut bill with no government spending. Okay, uh, and so what about uh, the fact that the rest of the world is taking off in terms of their technology uh, in energy, and what about the people who lost uh, jobs, 8.4 million, 8.4 million uh, just since the recession started? So, I mean, what, what we're, about... We're continuing to lose jobs. The stimulus package has not done anything near to what the, the economists predicted and what the administration said. The international experience hasn't been always positive. Spain, Germany, and Denmark have experienced extreme job losses in direct relation to targeted government subsidies with respect toward the Green Jobs Act. Um, only one in ten of the jobs created in, through green investment is permanent in Spain. Germany now, is Spain, experiencing the that, same thing. Now, you, do, you recognize Spain is a whole, uh, a whole other issue that, that relates to, uh, to deficits and debt and the euro. So, I mean, I'm, I mean let's talk about another country. Let's not do, let's not do Spain. Uh, Spain is having some problems like Greece, so, but but I just want to deal with what I'm trying to get. You know, if you were you've been sitting in this seat, what you have said, let's just forget everybody, forget everything. Let's just have some some more tax cuts that, by the way, were passed uh, without any kind of means of making up for the for the tax laws. Would that have been your policy? If I was sitting in that chair right now, there were several things I would have done. Passing a massive spending bill is not one of them. Repealing the Davis-Bacon Act, enacting other reforms, making government more transparent. Economists say. Drilling areas. That we, there's ways to reduce our energy sure. independence and extend security. Okay, my um, last statement, because my time is running out. Ec uh, economists say that had, uh, had, had uh, wages kept up uh, with uh, with uh, the the rising uh, uh, cost of living, that minimum wage today would be twenty one twenty dollars and sixty five cents an hour. So I mean I'm I'm I, coming out of public housing. I'm I'm concerned about everyday human beings who are losing their jobs and suffering, and now have the opportunity to get a job doing weatherization, and they're doing it in my district. So it's not like a phantom job. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from West Virginia, Ms. Thank Capito. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the witnesses here today. Um, just for a bit of a background, I represent the state of West Virginia, which we know is a very um, energy-rich state in uh, natural resources. Under the Since the stimulus bill was passed, our uh, unemployment has gone from, in January of 2009, 6.7 to up over 10.5 percent, and it's steadily climbing, a source of great concern for us in our state. Um, I'm interested on a couple of uh, issues. Uh, first of all, the statement by Mr. Johnson that, and Mr. Gaynor, you may be able to help us with this, that uh, the 80 percent of the um, dollars that went for wind production were uh, for foreign companies that are manufacturing off seas. I noticed in your statement you said, um, overseas, excuse me, you said you, you buy your components from uh, domestic manufacturing. Is that why? I mean, can you help me with that? Uh, we have historically, in, since, um, since we've been building our business, we have historically bought uh, turbines from General Electric and Clipper Wind Power, which are. That are 
uh, those manufactured are both domestic, in domestic uh, suppliers. But the statement about it, would you say, generally speaking, that most of the wind production jobs are uh, in, in terms of the making the actual turbines and stuff off uh, overseas? Is that correct? Um, AWEA has actually released some data that shows, in for all of the sixteen oh three dollars, those projects I think were a total of fifty three percent of the components were actually sourced domestically. So that's forty seven percent went over. Forty seven not. That. I also want to mention thirty seven. Just the the trend the trend of um, where it was back in 05, I think the number was twenty five percent, and just anecdotally, new wind power companies. Clipper is a good example. It's homegrown here in the U S. They're adding They have added manufacturing facilities. Vestas, which is a um, a large Danish manufacturer, has also made a very large manufacturing commitment in Colorado. So although the number, I think 53 percent is, it, it's true, that means 47 percent is coming from overseas. I think the trend is certainly favorable. My view is that one of the uh, things that's making that happen is, is the Recovery Act. Well, I think that, you know, it, certainly in my state as we're, we're being um, uh, told that we need to wean ourselves from fossil energy fuel production. Uh, and I wanted to ask Mr. Ashley, too, in his, uh, in, Norcross Junior, in Norcross, Georgia, what is the energy, uh, how do you generate your power in your, in your manufacturing facility? How is it generated? I'm, I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, we buy our power from the local uh, utility. And, and how do they generate their power? Is it natural gas, coal, nuclear? Uh, I believe it's a combination of coal, uh, gas, and nuclear. It's Georgia Power, which is owned by the Southern Company. Right, okay. Uh, and you, in disturbing in your testimony, in my viewpoint, is that you have opportunities for business expansion that you said you just saw three weeks ago uh, in India, and you were unable to take advantage of that. Um, I, you know, if, if we're being told that we need to replace our fossil fuel jobs with green jobs, and you can't, uh, expand your business, and we're buying components from uh, all around the, the world and not in the United States, how can we uh, reasonably think that the replacement of, of coal miners and others is going to take place here in this country when obviously we're not competing well internationally? This is the question I have. If we're going to have the green jobs in our country and in our states that are going to be uh, penalized under a cap-and-trade uh, proposal, how are we going to attract these jobs into our states? Well, I, I can't comment. I don't propose uh, uh, taking jobs away from coal miners at all. We need uh, renewable energy because we need a combination of all energy sources to meet the world's need, uh, and not Couldn't just agree here in more. the United States. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, uh, this this is a three challenge. megawatt project that we're doing in India right now is bringing irrigation to people for the first time ever because of, of the locational flexibility of solar. It's not just about the U.S. The U.S. could do a heck of a lot more especially in Georgia, but a lot of people have fought it so long. No, look, we need power, especially peak shaving power, Congress lady. It, it's not taking jobs away from somebody. It's not a zero-sum game, I don't believe. I, I, would, I would certainly add to that in, in, or echo the same sentiment. Um, where, the, the, where we're building wind farms, we're not, we're not taking away jobs from people that operate nuclear plants or natural gas plants hydro plants, solar plants. These are, these are new jobs that are being created. Um, and, and it also, you know, from, from, from a, a wind perspective, you know, wind is not the only solution. Renewables are not the only solution. Nuclear, coal, clean coal especially is all part of the solution. So I, I, don't, I don't see them as replacing, you, you're not, they're, they're, it's not a zero sum game, it's, it's, it's additive. That's been our experience. Well, I, I agree. I mean, I do think this is where I think, uh, you know, we are in agreement here. I would like to say, uh, in um, even though I did not vote for the uh, stimulus package, I do, in my district, do have a uh, very expansive clean coal carbon sequestration experimentation going on right now at the AEP plant, the Mountaineer plant on the Ohio River, uh, right across the river from, uh, from you all. So uh, I'm gr very hopeful that this will uh, result in uh, the technology and in the investment that will um, give us that all of the above energy plan uh, so that we can expand our solar, expand our wind, but still keep our base load energy going. So thank you all very much. You're welcome. Great. Gentlelady's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Spear.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Johnson, in your um, exchange with Mr. Cleaver, you um, spoke about the tax credits, or, or I should say the tax cuts that you supported. Uh, and I think it's really important when you speak up on this issue that you be um, knowledgeable. The actual ERA funding, the largest amount of money in ERA is for tax cuts. It's $288 billion in tax cuts. The next largest amount is $275 billion, which is, in fact, the money that's being distributed to try and create jobs. And then the third area is $224 billion, which is unemployment benefits. Now, do you not support extending unemployment benefits and COBRA benefits for no, people who no, are out I do of work? Not. All right, so two-thirds of the recovery bill you support. I support tax cuts when they're a standalone tax cut. I, they're coupled with other measures. The, the, the economic offset is far too great. The spending component of this bill completely skews the economy. These jobs would not be created. I mean, they're saying they're not taking jobs away from other people. And with all due respect, you need this money to create these jobs, or the private sector would not create them on their own, which means they're not there yet. All right. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, I would like to give an opportunity to all of the other participants on the panel to respond to Mr. Johnson's uh, criticisms and uh, of your specific programs, if you would. Mr. Ashley? Uh, yes. Just last week, we were voted uh, by the Wall Street Journal. We were named number two VC-backed company in renewable energy. Uh, and this week, we were ranked number 15 in the Wall Street Journal's top 50. There's people wanting to give us money in the private sector as well, but we need help from the government right now to expand faster and quicker just because debt is in such terrible shape in this country. Uh, solar is getting, because of efficiency work that companies like us are doing, much, much, much more competitive in the market. And the, and the people that are the antagonists of solar <coughs> constantly use old pricing. Uh, they, they misuse the technology. They, when they're making comparisons of thin films and solars, they use one technology to represent all of solar in particular situations. It's changed a lot, uh, and uh, it's very viable. It's getting more viable. But if we're serious about not letting the Chinese, the Taiwanese, and other own this industry, we need to do more here, just like they're doing. They think it's important. They're investing a heck of a lot of money. The rest of the world thinks it's important. We should, too. That's my point. A follow-up question, Mr. Ashley. When the Section 1603 uh, program expires, are you going to be able to continue to finance and construct in your industry? Uh, I believe so because of our worldwide demand, yes. Uh, I wish 1603 would continue to be expanded just to expand domestic demand for solar because it's good for the industry, uh, et cetera, at this point in time. But the key right now is the financial situation that banks are in and lending, borrowing money. You can't get money, even with a very positive scenario. The interest rates they want to charge you and the terms are very onerous, and uh, it's still very difficult. Thank you. Ms. Wright? Well, I think um, quite simply, um, if, you, if you take a look at where we believe the transportation industry is going to go in an uncertain time frame, whether it's over the next five years or 50 years, there's an awful lot of risk and technological uncertainty around how we will um, transport ourselves around. And the fact is, the United States does not have the infrastructure to be prepared to make that transition. Um, over the past several decades, we've allowed our manufacturing base to erode, become a service economy, um, and frankly, while we're technology leaders, we allow the um, countries around the world to implement it and commercialize it. And um, so from our perspective, one, we would not have been coming to the United States to do this. Um, two, the, um, we need to continue to expand our R&D and technological capabilities so that we can not only catch up but start to lead. And that's risky, and private sector is not going to bear that cost all by itself. We're going to need strong collaboration with the government. And that's going to be skin in the game for private sector, skin in the game for the government as well. Um, and, you know, so, I, you know, from our perspective, we are a for-profit company. 
and we're for allowing market forces to, to take their course. But there are unnatural events and disruptive events taking place that are going to change how we get ourselves around, and we have to do it as a partnership. Mr. Pat McDaniel, there were a lot of statistics that Mr. Johnson was spewing out that would suggest that weatherization is not working. Well, um, saying as we weatherized over 8,100 homes, and I would be the last person who has personally walked into those homes and seen um, the families who've benefited, that this was not a worthwhile program. Uh, as far as Davis-Bacon, uh, only 30% of our agencies had to adjust their payroll, which meant that those jobs were well-paying in the first place. And uh, so da Davis-Bacon certainly has not hampered uh, the program. The adjustments were not significant. Um, and, I, you know, I, I think that uh, I would be the last person also to say to those thousand men and women who were trained and are now working with a trade, to weatherize homes uh, shouldn't have had those programs and that we shouldn't have had the recovery money and uh, that they shouldn't have had the opportunity to provide for their families. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I see my time has expired. I, Mr. Gaynor may or may not have okay, a no, comment. We have time. Thank you. Yeah, from, from our perspective, if we take a long view on the policy of getting this country towards a, a, a you know, independent of, of you know, more energy independent, then what the Recovery Act did in the short term is send a signal to the, to, to the capital markets that the government is going to put some skin in the game, and that's certainly what happened. And I would argue that it was a, a crucial bridge that the government provided in the 1603. Um, and I think from, from a long-term policy perspective, um, I think if you, if, again, if we, if we, if we want to uh, hit the energy independence targets and renewable energy targets, you're going to need a policy that is sustainable and sends a signal to the capital markets where most of most if not all of the money is going to come from over the long term that uh, the policies are there and the and you know both at the federal level and the state level um, so that is that is certainly where we see the the long term play on the policy okay, thank you General lady's time has expired so um, we had a great year in two thousand and nine people were predicting that wind was going to just go right off a cliff, huh? that uh, we were going to drop from 8,400 new megawatts of electrical generation from wind in 2008. Uh, and because we were deep in a recession, uh, because the economic climate was not good, that perhaps we could go down to only 4,000 megawatts of new wind uh, that was generated in the United States. But then, because of the a stimulus bill, we wound up producing 10,000 new megawatts of wind in the United States. And what a great story that is, because, you know, just for, you know, people who aren't really familiar with this, that, that uh, a nuclear power plant, a thousand megawatt nuclear power plant, you think of a, a nuclear power plant that you might have heard of, Seabrook, or Diablo Canyon, or you name it, that's about a thousand megawatts, a nuclear power plant. 10,000 new megawatts of wind installed in the United States in 2009 alone. Uh, it went up when everyone predicted it was going to be cut in half. And so that's a tremendous story because obviously uh, that wind is in the United States of America. And those facilities will be going for a long, long time. And as we move to electrifying our automotive fleet, um, the electricity that we are putting into the vehicles will be generated here in the United States. We won't be importing oil from OPEC. Uh, we can tell OPEC we don't need their uh, oil any more than we need their sand because we're going to start generating the, the, uh, the electricity for the all-electric vehicles, uh, for the hybrid electric vehicles here in the United States. So that's a tremendous story. huh? So let me go back over to you, Mr. Johnson. Um, of the $787 billion in the recovery package, $288 billion of the $787 billion were tax cuts. So did you support the $288 billion worth of tax cuts? I support tax cuts on their own, not when they're coupled with a massive government spending. But if we just made it a $288 billion tax break program, you would support that? Yes, just you, the tax cuts. Okay. So your problem was when we started 
giving out extending unemployment benefits or I am opposed uh, to unemployment insurance and massive government spending programs that tilt the market in favor no, of... What I'm saying is you, don't, you didn't like the unemployment benefit extension in the bill. I am opposed to unemployment benefit extension, Okay, yes. and, and I think that's important, and it's an honest position to have, that you oppose unemployment benefits extension. If, We're going to try to strap Congressman uh, Cleaver in over here, okay, as he's listening to this. Um, and also, uh, the same thing is true for extension of health care benefits to people who have lost their health care benefits. Uh, you also don't believe that that's a good expenditure of federal money as well. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I, I, yes, okay. sir. Well, that's, that's, I do agree with that. That's a fair? Uh, unemployment insurance extension has been shown by several think tanks and organizations to prolong the unemployment process by making individuals more dependent upon the federal government. And if I can't address the statistics I was spewing on weatherization, it's from spewing the Office of Inspector General, um, a, a, a government agency, and they have a table right here. And actually in California, only 0.03% of uh, units have been weatherized out of 43,400 that have been planned. No, I get it. But let me just go back to you, uh, Ms. Pat McDale. How many new jobs did you create in Ohio in 2009 from the weatherization project? 1,000. And that's, as of 2009, we're still counting. That's great. So that's a lot of jobs, a lot of people who would not, been able, who would not have been able to uh, work. So let's move over to you, Mr. Ashley. That's a great story that the wind industry has 10,000 new megawatts. And what's the projection for 2010, uh, Mr. Gaynor, in the wind industry? Then we'll come to you, Mr. Ashley. Uh, certainly at least 10,000 new megawatts. Uh, at least 10,000 new megawatts. Least, uh, certainly we're, from, from our perspective, we're building um, slightly less than we put online in 2009, but just, just ever so slightly. So, but the industry consensus is uh, at least, at least 10,000. So if we did 10,000 megawatts of wind every year between now and 2020, uh, that would be 110,000 new megawatts of wind on top of the 35,000 megawatts that the United States already has, the 10,000 in 2009, the 8,400 in 2008, and then much smaller numbers in the preceding years. But that would wind up at 145,000 new megawatts of wind installed in the United States by the year 2020 in the entire nuclear industry after decades of subsidies from the federal taxpayers only has 100,000 new, uh, has a total of 100,000 megawatts, which is about 18 percent of all electrical generating capacity. Is that a realistic uh, goal for the I, wind industry? I certainly think that you know, wind technology is, is improving. One of, the, one of the things that everybody is uh, concerned about is what is the price? What is the price of delivered wind? And I think with uh, when you, if, if you want to scale up to, the, to that level, doing 10,000 megawatts a year, increasing domestic manufacturing, you have to assume that with the, all of that additional capacity that's, that will be built in the U.S., that the price, the price per unit will come down, making wind a lot more competitive. So, so if, if, that is, if that is certainly true, then you could see that the growth could sustain itself. Wow. But so, and again, let me go back to the point that I, I, I heard you make in your testimony, which was that four years ago, only 25 percent of the components of a wind turbine were made in the United States. And in 2009, after the stimulus bill, the recovery package passed, it zoomed up to over 50 percent of the component parts of a wind turbine were made in the United States. Is that correct? That's correct. That, oh, that's that, a huge turnaround. Those are, the, those are the statistics from AWEA based on all of the 1603 projects. Right. And um, again, we, we, we would expect that to continue as if you're going to keep adding uh, megawatts, wind turbines are big, mm -hmm. uh, they're difficult to transport, so having right. them made locally uh, makes a lot more sense. So right. no, that sounds great. So you're saying during the Bush administration, 25 percent of wind turbine component parts were made in the United States. During the Obama administration, the percent has doubled uh, to over 50 percent. So that's a huge shift from the Bush administration, which was clearly allowing for these component parts to be built overseas, that we had to import them from other countries. And clearly the Bush administration was just turning a blind eye to this incredible drain of revenue. But under the Obama uh, the 
position. We now see a dramatic increase in domestic production. We see a capacity being built here in our country and a turnaround from this Bush administration era perspective that had us importing oil from OPEC. In fact, President Bush over there asking the, so asking the Saudis to please produce a couple of more million barrels of oil a day in April of 2008, even as the wind turbines that we were installing in our country were being imported from other countries as well. What a disastrous policy for our country. So now, with this installation of new renewable energy resources in our country, we see more domestic production. We actually see the jobs being created here in our country. And we are seeing a reduction, actually, in the importation of oil in our country. All of it great, especially with these new battery technologies that Ms. Wright and Johnson Control are beginning to manufacture here in our country, which will make it possible for us to have these all-electric vehicles. Mr. Gaynor? Uh, agree, I agree with the statements. Um, what, one other point to make is, is that, um, again, in order to hit these saturation levels in wind, uh, battery technology is, is going to be a, a piece of that uh, p technical pie as well. And as I mentioned in my comments, we were awarded a, uh, uh, the, a conditional commitment from the DOE for one of our projects in Hawaii that we're building this year. It's a wind, it's a wind farm on the north shore of Oahu, coupled with a, a, a battery energy storage system that is actually made by a domestic manufacturer called Extreme Power. So, uh, and by the way, in the Waxman Markey bill, just for the record, we actually included 60 to 100 billion dollars for carbon capture and sequestration technology for the coal industry. But of course, Peabody Coal is leading the opposition to that bill. Peabody Coal. So it's not like we're not trying to help the coal industry. We are. Uh, but Peabody Coal doesn't want, you know, any part of a comprehensive bill to deal uh, with the uh, issue. And so as a result, you know, we, we, we're not going to stop helping the industries that uh, want to move forward, uh, but uh, we're not going to allow them at the same time, the Peabody Coals of the world, to say, don't make any progress at all on any front. You know, we can't, we can't block. Because we can't make progress on all fronts doesn't mean that we can't make progress on any front. So let me come back to you, uh, Mr. Ashley. Could you give us a little update on the solar industry? How many new megawatts were installed in the United States in 2009? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have seen uh, several figures, one between 450 and 480 megawatts. How many, do you know how many were installed in the United States in 2008? Uh, much less than that, I believe less than 300 megawatts. Okay, so nearly a doubling yeah. of solar Substantial increase. installation in the United States. So almost, as you are saying, it is like half of a nuclear power plant was installed in solar in the United States in 2009. Uh, yes, sir. In our industry association, the latest numbers uh, look like probably around 10,000 direct, indirect, and induced jobs in solar in 2009, thanks to the 1603 provisions and 60 percent. Now, when you say 1603, no one knows what you're talking about. They're trying to think of something famous that happened in history in 1603, and That's they don't the re they don't remember getting the right answer in the sixth grade. So, I don't. I, people have no idea what you're talking about. What is 1603? What, what would be a good well, give us another title for 1603 that would, people would understand. If it's you explain to your mother why, you know, why this was such a, how would you explain it to her? It is taking a, a tax credit, which is uh, a very good idea, and making it better because the Well, what would you call the program? Don't use the word tax credit. Solar incentive. The solar incentive program, yeah. And so with the solar incentive program, we were able to double the amount of solar in one year produced here in the United States, creating upwards of 10,000 jobs? Uh, yes, sir. That is that's correct. And wow. I think going forward it will also be important to, de to develop the domestic industry because even some of the foreign, my competitors that are foreign, will come here and build plants if the industry is big enough. Now, you know, I don't like that, but it is it's, it's good, healthy competition. Wow. Because I tell you, Malaysia and China will give me a lot of money and a lot of okay. grants to come build a okay. plant and, here, and rather so than Saginaw, Michigan. And so what percent of solar uh, uh, new jobs were created here in the United States uh, per, uh, as part of the Obama stimulus plan? Do you know? Uh, I believe that the job numbers that I just mentioned. Okay. So a very high percentage of yes, all the yes, new jobs yes. that were created in the solar area were here in the United States. Yes, and, and to be fair, going back to the initial 
stimulus uh, bill in December of 2008 when the tax credit was extended for three years or several years, et cetera. From that point forward and then when the Obama administration came in, it really gave the industry uh, a shot in the arm and the confidence to expand. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that there's a massive reindustrialization of the United States going on, that we've moved under the Bush era to uh, with only 25 uh, percent of uh, wind jobs here in the United States, and we import 75 percent, to now it's over 50 percent of the wind jobs are here in the United States, and the percentage keeps going up uh, as almost each month goes by. I think the ultimate goal is that 70 percent of all of the wind jobs will be here in the United States by the time the Obama stimulus package is, uh, is completed. Uh, and, uh, and that's a big good news story because people are wondering where are the jobs for the next generation going to come from? What is the next new industry in our country? So what we're hearing from Mr. Ashley and Mr. Gaynor and Ms. Wright are huge good news uh, stories in terms of jobs here for Americans. Um, and Mr. Johnson seems to support using tax credits to accomplish these goals. Uh, he hasn't voiced any opposition to tax credits creating these incentives. So here we have a huge area of agreement uh, and an agreement. Do you agree, Mr. Johnson, that at least in these areas that the tax breaks are working and we're creating um, uh, these jobs that are uh, helping to uh, put people back to work in our own country? Yeah, tax credits generally tend to do that, yes, Mr. Chairman. That's great. And so, so, uh, so from, the, from the perspective of the, uh, uh, of the, of the billions of dollars that uh, are going to be spent in wind and solar and batteries and other programs, that's good. You agree with that? Tax credits that just tax cuts that stimulate are good. the that's economy good. and create jobs tax, tax, are, are good. That's great. So, um, so that's a big success uh, story for us, and we do understand that you don't like spending federal dollars on unemployment insurance for unemployed Americans. But what we're trying to do, as you probably can appreciate, is we don't like paying unemployment benefits either. We actually hate the idea of unemployment benefits if people can have a job. So we're trying to create the jobs over here that could then make it unnecessary for people to have to go in and to uh, actually apply for unemployment benefits. The evidence that we actually have that people don't like to collect unemployment benefits is that when unemployment went down to 4 percent in our country, all the people who are now unemployed actually took jobs and worked in them. Okay? But when jobs are not available, uh, unfortunately, and much to their own personal chagrin, they are first forced to go and to accept unemployment benefits. But we have evidence that every single ethnic group in the United States, whites, blacks, Asians, uh, 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 Hispanics, um, and uh, male and female all take jobs when they're available to them. Uh, but unfortunately, because of a recession induced by reckless uh, mismanagement of the uh, financial marketplace during the Bush administration, almost turning a blind eye to an oncoming uh, economic uh, uh, disaster, um, we have seen a tremendous, uh, high, tremendously high rate of unemployment. So that's the conundrum that we face, because we don't, we don't, we, the reason we don't want to pay unemployment benefits is that we hate to see people unemployed. Uh, and, um, but we recognize the moral uh, necessity of helping people in those times of desperation. But these kinds of programs are working and working very successfully. Let me turn back to the gentleman from uh, Missouri to see if he has any additional points he might want one, to make. Some po uh, yeah, one point and then a question. Uh, you know, uh, having grown up in public housing, is around poor people. I grew up hearing that people had babies so they could get $190 a month uh, welfare and, uh, and that people didn't work. My father, my father worked um, on three jobs, uh, cleaned up the T.A. Lytikin building on Saturday mornings, worked at the Wichita Club as a maitre d', and then did yards uh, on the weekend, sent four kids through college. I can remember my father being unemployed. Uh, one of the most miserable time of my life, seeing him almost in depression. But the question related to what I've just said is, uh, do, do you know how we know that, I mean, how we determine whether or not people get uh, unemployment uh, uh, compensation? Mr. Johnson, do you know how, how we find out whether or not they, can, they get unemployment? 
Uh, not off the top of my head. Y yes, but, but yes, I, that, and that's why this is important, I think, um, because you said you thought it was a disincentive for people to look for jobs. The only people who can get unemployment checks are the people looking for jobs. You have to go to the State Unemployment Bureau seeking a job to get unemployment compensation. So it is not a disincentive. The people, only people who get, get this are out struggling trying to find jobs. And as the chairman mentioned, they're not the 8.4 million jobs. I mean, you know, so I mean, when you say disincentive, I just want to make sure that you know that you have to look for a job to get the money. You, so you don't think it's a disincentive now, do you? Since I've I still think it is. Uh, I've read several studies specifically from James Shirk, an economist at the Heritage Foundation, that um, say several things to the contrary of what you just stated, uh, that it actually helps prolong individuals not finding uh, work but, because but they're you satisfied by having. Mm -hmm. But you didn't know that, that's, that you couldn't get that. You, I mean, you just said you didn't know that. I didn't know off the top of my head I had heard that. I know, but, but now that you know, does that fact, I mean, it's it's... You can't contradict that fact. It is a fact. So knowing that fact, do you now change? It's also a fact that since the stimulus package has been signed into law, we've lost 3.3 million jobs. I'm glad these individuals here are creating jobs. And the Ohio weatherization program is a huge success. I will grant them that. The Inspector General uh, report even recognizes it as a success. But it is one of the states, one of the only states having success with this program. Um, there are individual success stories everywhere, but the package as a whole and the reality is the jobs have not been created since the stimulus package and that was its goal to create jobs. More work has been created for certain individuals who have jobs but the overall jobs impact has not materialized. So now that you know that the fact that you have to be looking for a job to get an unemployment check, uh, now that you, you know that to be a fact it's unquestionable. If anybody in here can contradict it, uh, you're saying you still uh, believe that it's a disincentive. I oppose extending unemployment insurance benefits, yes. I know, but, but will you continue to say it's a disincentive uh, uh, to, to provide those benefits? Until since, I see empirical data otherwise, based on what I've read and learned in the past, yes. Okay, so you don't believe what I was just saying, that, that you have to be... I, I would be very interested to see empirical data uh, supporting your, what you're saying. That you have to be in, the, uh, how, uh, how do you think you get the checks? The people get checks. I'm speaking of the disincentive issue. I have read reports that showed that it was a disincentive and it did disincentivize based on surveys, uh, reports, et cetera. Okay, we're kind of talking past each other and, and you know, when, I make a, when somebody makes a good point, I always say, eh, you made a good point, but since we can't do that, uh, I appreciate very much you coming. One of my, one of my, person I spend a lot of time with here uh, is a Republican who, and we, we, we absolutely have nothing in common with regard to our political views. We just like each other. And so we can, you know, argue and, and not get angry and still sit down and have lunch. Uh, the, the one thing I guess we don't do, which is why we have a relationship, is because when he can prove something, I'll say, nah, okay. And, and the same on the other side. And so I guess my frustration is that, uh, you know, if you can get anybody, and I'll wait here, you can call somebody, call Heritage and find out if I'm, if I made up, made up the fact that that's the only way you can get your, your check is looking for a job. I'll, I'll, I just, you know, when you go out and say it's a disincentive and people don't know any differently, they, they then begin to embrace the beliefs that there are some people who are just lazy sitting around trying to take their tax dollars. And, and I grew up in a, in a situation like that, seeing it and hearing it, and it's, 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 it's really a, an insult to a lot of good, hardworking Americans. So I, I do appreciate you being here, and I appreciate your, your, your passion, uh, and I hope, hope that you will check my uh, fact out and then send me a, uh, an email apologizing. Thank you. Thank you. So, so have you had, when, when you uh, create these new jobs in solar or wind, uh, 
on weatherization, do you find that there are a lot of people who want to work as soon as you announce that there are new jobs available? Do you have any problem in finding people who want to work as soon as, as, soon as you put out an ad for uh, new employees, Mr. Gaynor? Uh, no, we have not had uh, problems. Just to give you one example, we have a, a small summer internship uh, program. We received 10x the, the number of resumes um, for you know, 10 jobs, we received 100 resumes. You get 10 times the applications for new jobs as the, as least, the number of new our, jobs you have. At least for our summer internship program. Right. Have that. you had any trouble, uh, Ms. Pat McDaniel, on finding people who uh, want No, to work? we have people fighting to get into our weatherization training work. programs to get the jobs. And hardly the, the payment received is not family sustaining wages. Ms. Wright, do you have trouble at Johnson Controls finding people who want to work when you advertise for new, um, new uh, employees? We're very fortunate to have a, a, a skilled automotive um, workforce in the area where our plant is located, so we're very fortunate to be able to reemploy them. You're saying people who got laid off yes. when the auto industry collapsed and who were forced to accept unemployment benefits, as soon as you advertise saying you can come back to work, they're on your doorstep saying. We have very, very highly skilled, experienced Beautiful. Workers. That's great news because, you know, some people believe that people enjoy being unemployed, and uh, I think there's sufficient evidence that that's not the case when a job is offered. Uh, Mr. Ashley, how about you? You find a lot of people? We, we had 600 applications for the last 30 jobs. That we for the last 30 jobs. That's people tremendous. Are, a lot of people are desperate. I yeah, I all, agree with you. And unfortunately, yeah. So 570 people perhaps had to stay on unemployment, but there was, you were able to help 30 people get meaningful employment. That's tremendous. So here's the good news. You want to see a really good news story? Here's Here's the, uh, here's the picture of, uh, of uh, jobs lost in the United States. And this is the Bush administration over here in red. And as we reached January 20th, 2009, we remember that day quite vividly, January 20th, 2009, 780,000 jobs were lost in January 2009. As you can see, following on a pattern of the preceding months, uh, of the Bush administration in terms of this failed economic policy, kind of if you don't answer calls uh, at the SEC that may, there's a guy named Madoff that uh, might be bilking people, if you don't regulate derivatives, or swaps, if you kind of turn a blind eye to the whole uh, uh, you know, impact that that could have, and many other things. 780,000 jobs in the month before 700,000, the month before 720,000. Really not a good picture, month after month. Then in February of 2009, the Obama administration arrives with a stimulus package. You know, you can't turn around the Queen Mary overnight, but look what happened in the months since then coming up to February. We almost have a reverse image of what was happening during the Bush administration. Month after month, we see fewer and fewer jobs being lost in our economy. For one month there, November, it actually went positive. We actually had job creation. Uh, and now we're down to a point where uh, it's no more uh, than 20, 30, 40,000 jobs that we're losing per month. So you can see that it's highly likely that this is going to start spiking up with new job creation in our country. Now, I would like to think that this economic plan of the President is working, that the stimulus bill is working, that the tax breaks are working, uh, and that we are turning a corner, uh, and that the Obama plan is the antidote to the Bush plan, two different plans about how to run the economy. Now, we didn't cause the accident. We're out in the street trying to clean it up. You know, some people start to blame us for trying to clean up the accident, okay? All that blood, you know, in our economy. So after a year, people start to, some people start to basically confuse the people cleaning up after the accident with the people who created it. And that's one of our problems. We admit that, okay? But it's a, it's, it's a political problem from a messaging perspective, not an economic problem from the perspective of how it is working. Um, and so what we are seeing in, 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 the, in the testimony we're hearing today from our witnesses is the incredible success of the stimulus bill. And if I could ask you, do you think 2010 
uh, Mr. Ashley, will be better than 2009 for the solar industry? Uh, yes, sir, I do. And like I said, we are sold out through mid-2011. You are sold out now. That is that's fantastic. Yeah, that's why Where I'm would you be right. without the stimulus bill? Uh, we would not be in that situation. You would not be. Uh, Mr. Gaynor, what does 2010 look like for you? 2010 is uh, we are building, expect to build 300 megawatts of capacity this year, seven wind farms, one of them we are just wrapping up. Where would you be without the stimulus plan? Uh, it, w it would be a much different picture. Uh, a better picture? Uh, no, it would not be a much better picture. It would, it would be much uh, worse. Uh, much worse. Ah, tough okay. tough to quantify. But again, the, 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 the thing that is important for our business is in, in a, in a capital-intensive business, you are taking um, what the Recovery Act is doing is not only getting those dollars, but you are taking a lot of dollars from the private sector and, and pulling it off the sidelines to come in and build it. So venture capitalists other investors, they are on the sideline, they are saying, oh, my goodness, look at all that blood in the economy, look at all that red. But all of a sudden in 2009 with the stimulus bill, they are saying, well, maybe it is safe again. Maybe we can go back into those economic waters and if there is going to be some Federal money, perhaps, and how many new uh, private sector dollars were you able to attract in 2009? Um, Seven hundred million dollars. Seven hundred million dollars just for your one company. Right. Amazing. That's a huge for, for, amount for of the, money for the sixteen oh three projects for the under the what project? The, the wind stimulus. The wind stimulus bill right. uh, attracted unbelievable seven hundred just for your one company. That's fantastic. And uh, Miss Wright over here in your battery uh, company, uh, how many new jobs would you have created in the United States in uh, two thousand and nine and two thousand and ten without the stimulus program? Very few. Uh, wait, by very few, what do you mean by that? Uh, potentially some engineers. How many? Our, potentially some engineers in our Milwaukee. But no, this some. When you say some, are you talking about hundreds? No, 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 no. No, what do you mean a by handful, some? A handful. What is a handful? With the, is that a handful? That's a handful. Five people, maybe. So now, with, because of the stimulus bill, how many do you think you'll be creating? So we'll be hiring engineers and scientists in Wisconsin as we've, and we've how many, already well, started. How, give us some numbers. People want to um, hear good news. People want to have hope that this economic recovery is going to continue and that Thank the you. stimulus bill is working. So how Good. many new people do you think will get hired? Well, so th if, you, if you'll indulge me for a moment, at full capacity, our plant in Holland will employ 550 people, not to mention... Your plant's where? In Holland, Michigan. Holland, Michigan. See, people think capacity. Holland is in Europe. No, Holland, no, Holland is <laughs> in Michigan. Holland, Michigan. So how many employees will you have in Holland, Michigan? At full capacity, it will be 550, not 550 to mention the supplier and the indirect jobs. In Milwaukee, we will continue to hire engineers and scientists to wow. promote our technology. So without the stimulus bill, a handful, five. Okay. With the stimulus bill, 500 and more people who will be working who otherwise would not be working here in the United States. And you wouldn't even be building a plant in the United States. Is that what you told us? That is correct. You'd be building it perhaps in Holland, Europe. <laughs> is that right? Uh, in the Netherlands, Holland? <laughs> <laughs> is that correct? In, somewhere in Europe or Asia. Yeah, That's correct. Yeah. So that wouldn't be good news for American workers. Um, so this is really a fantastic good news story for our country. And this energy sector just might be the brightest of all the bright spots in the recovery bill uh, because it gives hope to families that there is going to be a, a source of new jobs from Mr. Cleaver and the smart grid they are building and uh, the most economically challenged part of Kansas City uh, through Georgia with uh, Mr. Ashley and uh, Mr. Gaynor's company that sprawls all across our country, Utah and Maine and states all across the, uh, our, our, um, our great uh, country. Uh, Ms. Wright is in Wisconsin and in Michigan uh, with her new job uh, creation. Uh, Ms. Pat McDonald in Ohio with 1,000 people out there weatherizing homes in 2009, but many more in 2010. Is that correct? Who will be out there? And, the, and you can't offshore weatherizing jobs. You've got to be there in Ohio. You have to be in Akron. You've got to be in Canton. If you're not there, it's not going to get weatherized. So those are by definition domestic jobs, huh? So these are engineers, you know, carpenters, uh, laborers, uh, uh, scientists. It's across the entire economic spectrum of, of our country, the people who are benefiting. So that is really great news. And it helps us to reduce, and here's where we'll share our 
our, 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 our agreement with Mr. Johnson. It will reduce the unemployment benefits that we have to pay out of uh, taxpayers' dollars for uh, people in our country. And that's one thing we really do hope to achieve. Mr. Uh, Cleaver, do you have anything you'd like to add here? I thank you. Do you want you want to say it again? Uh, I think no. I think we're we're just trying to make a point here. And you know, a lot of people they don't like um, they didn't like statistics in school, which is why they didn't take the course. But a graph like this um, speaks for itself. It's you know the end of the Bush administration, the beginning of the Obama administration. Just two different plans. One and one we were about to go off a cliff here with red ink for our country, people unemployed, 780,000 new people unemployed. You come back, you come forward one year, we're down to 22,000 people who uh, newly entered into the unemployment rates. What an incredible change, more than three quarters of a million people fewer who were unemployed uh, this uh, past uh, month than the last month of the Bush administration. And, uh, and so this energy sector is something that we're not going to walk away from. Your stories today really give us hope for the future. They really make us believe that we have a chance um, to, uh, to create a new industrial sector in our country, to back out imported oil, to not replace made by OPEC with made in China without ever having a made in the USA uh, energy strategy. Uh, and what you represent is that, that alternative, the made in the USA a strategy. And we've used tax benefits, loan guarantees in the stimulus bill in order to accomplish that goal. And your story is tremendous. So here's what I'll do. I'll give each one of you one minute to give us the one thought that you want us to remember, one minute apiece, without using 1603 or the words uh, tax credits, okay? You try to put it in the simplest possible form for the American people so they can understand what has happened uh, over the last year and what you want to see continue. So we'll go in inverse order and we'll begin with you, Mr. Johnson. Okay. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, the chairman and the members for allowing me to come here today. Uh, I think in order to create real job growth, we need to consider uh, freezing um, all proposed tax increases and costly regulations until unemployment falls at least below 7%. Uh, freezing spending and restricting unspent stimulus funds, reforming regulations to reduce unnecessary business costs such as uh, reforming Sarbanes-Oxley, um, reforming the tort system to lower costs and uncertainty facing new businesses, remove barriers to domestic energy production in Alaska and the Outer Continental Shelf, uh, completely repeal the job-killing Davis-Bacon Act, uh, pass pending free trade agreements with South Korea, Colombia, and Panama, and reduce taxes on companies' foreign earnings if they bring those earnings home. Uh, I think those are all sustainable, and we need to incorporate an all-of-the-above energy approach working with the individuals here today, and I uh, thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Mr. Ashley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and again, I, I'm proud to be here before the committee today. Uh, the key thing I'd like to leave you with is, is please continue to help us build this renewable energy resource and economy here in the United States rather than abroad. Many other countries are very serious about this industry. They want to own this industry. We want the jobs to stay here in the U.S. We want to be competitive in the rest of the world. Programs like the XM Bank and their wonderful opera facilities, which we've also used and others are helping a lot, and DOE loan guarantees. But the, the stimulus that you've started and you're doing is really helping us, and it will make a big difference for jobs and, I think, uh, the security of this country going forward. Great. Thank you, Ms. Ashley. Mr. R Ms. Wright. Thank you, Chairman Markey and committee members. And because of your actions, we've made a commitment to be here in the United States versus being somewhere else. And we've also made a commitment to stand up the industry and the entire value chain so we can drive domestic capability and competency. We, have, we need your help in creating the demand so for short term, while the market is sorting itself out, we can drive scale, drive the economics so that we can employ these people and we can employ them sustainably and stand on our own without subsidies and without incentives because that's how we want it to work. But I would implore you to help us to make sure that we leverage these investments that the U.S. government and the U.S. taxpayers have made and the faith they've put in us and make sure we leverage those vehicles and that demand with the components and the systems that were made from those tax dollars here in the United States so that we do have a U.S. battery cartel, not an Asian battery cartel. 
I love it. Thank, Thank you. you. Ms. Pat McDaniel. I want to say that Ohio is very happy to make use of our Recovery Act funds. I've already talked about our weatherization. We're using our other energy dollars to invest in the growth of those industries. For example, in our wind supply chain, we have 600 companies who are providing uh, parts to turbines and are also creating jobs. We continue to use that money to incent industry and leverage more growth and job creation. I've really appreciated the opportunity to speak and um, we would like to have additional assistance from the federal government to continue to grow those jobs in Ohio. Beautiful. Thank you. Mr. Gaynor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I also want to uh, extend my thanks for allowing me to testify here today. Um, we're just at the beginning. This is a, we've got a long, long way to go. And I would encourage uh, Congress to continue to send those signals, those strong policy signals to the private sector uh, over, the, over the long term. That's probably a federal renewable energy standard. Uh, in the short term, as the financial crisis and the financial markets continue to heal, could be an extension of the convertible ITC. So that's, those are my parting thoughts. Thank you very much. We thank you so much. And I'm, I'm, I know everyone watching C-SPAN wants to learn more about a convertible ITC. Um, but I, I understand what you're saying. Okay, but but uh, our, our, our job is to put it into English. Uh, and, uh, and so what, what, uh, what we will do is we will pass a renewable electricity standard for the United States. So we have a goal of 15 percent, 20 percent of all electricity generated from renewables because by definition they're here in America. We have to use our own energy resources to do that and we'll put the tax breaks, we'll put the loan guarantees in place so that the private sector will step up uh, and to create this engine of growth in uh, our own country, uh, creating uh, ultimately hundreds of thousands uh, of new jobs just in this energy uh, sector alone uh, and again meeting the challenge of importing too much oil from OPEC uh, and trying to avoid a situation uh, where we're imp importing our batteries, our solar, and our wind technologies from China. We have to avoid it. We need a plan. And America is at its best when it has a plan. Uh, and uh, the Obama administration has begun to put together that plan. We see the early results, which are fantastic, uh, and we're now going to work to expand upon it. Uh, this year and next. We thank you all for testifying here today.